Good morning, everyone. So I'm going to move on now to the next section with you, which is going to be care of horses with orthopedic conditions. So I, there's a set of notes on Moodle called equine orthopedics, and I'm going to ask you to read through those yourself um, for between now and Friday. And as you're going through them, if there's anything you don't understand, please post a query on the Moodle forum, and that way I can respond to the queries and everybody else can see the answers as well. So it'll keep us all on the one page. I'm, I did think about going through the notes like this, but I think it would make it quite difficult. It would be quite long and I don't think you'd find it very engaging. So what I decided to do instead was to use what's in the equine orthopedics notes and apply it to a, a case study. So I've done up a case study here of an orthopedic case and I'm going to get you to work through it um, once you've read the notes and or refer to the notes as you go along to see how you would use your knowledge to provide patient care in this particular circumstance. So um, the scenario is you're, you're in your veterinary hospital and you get a phone call from a racehorse trainer who said that one of their horses has pulled up lame on the gallops this morning and he's now sore with swelling over his cannon bone and fetlock joint. So the vet um, you know, hasn't been out to see this horse yet. The client is making the initial phone call to tell you that they have a problem. A racehorse trainer is an experienced person, they're licensed, so they are familiar with the type of conditions that might arise in racehorses and they're going to get onto you straight away. So this would be a, a fairly typical scenario. Okay, so you've just hung up the phone to the trainer. What are you going to do next? So I'm going to suggest you pause the video here for a minute and jot down a couple of notes to yourself. What would be maybe three things you'd do next and, and why, what would you do first and so on. Okay. So assume when you've paused the video, I'm going to suggest that the first thing you're going to do is arrange for a vet to go out there and treat the horse. Okay, he's lame. You know, we don't yet know what's wrong with him. We don't want to risk moving him until we have established that it's safe to do so. So the first protocol is to, is to send the vet out there. Okay. So is this something that can wait till later in the afternoon? Is it a dire emergency? No, but it would be an urgent case. The horse is not, um, the trainer hasn't reported to be distressed or down or trashing or anything. But at the same time, this could be potentially very serious and it's certainly painful if the animal is suddenly gone lame. So we'll send someone out there. We'll divert a vet on the road from a separate call as soon as possible. The next thing you gotta think about is, does that vet have what they need with them? So what are you going to need to send with that person? Hopefully they'll have, um, routine medication in their car, they'll have painkillers, they'll have sedatives if they need them, they'll have bandaging material. Specific things for this case is the main need, if you have a portable digital x-ray system, that would be very handy, it would allow you to x-ray the animal on site to establish exactly what's wrong um, with the musculoskeletal system before we move the horse. Likewise, if they have an ultrasound machine with them, they can do some soft tissue ultrasound when they arrive on site if that's necessary. They'll also hopefully have um, enough bandage material and a splint to stabilize the limb if it is decided that the horse needs to be transported and it's safe to do so. So if you go back and revise your equine transport lectures from the Animal Welfare and Husbandry module last year, that'll help with that as well. And then they also have to have a means to euthanize this horse if they turn out there, turn up there and it turns out the animal has um, a fracture or an injury that's too severe to be treated and there's no welfare grounds on which to transport the horse, then they should be able to euthanize it on site as well, rather than having to wait for that to happen. So there are some things to think about. Other things you're going to do is um, you're going to ask the trainer, have you informed the owner? So remember in this case, very few racehorse trainers own their own horses. They're normally training them on behalf of an owner. Um, the owner is the person who's going to get the bill. They're the person to whom this animal belongs. Whereas in this case, the trainer is the keeper of the horse. So you're going to ask the trainer, maybe ring them back and say, have you, have you spoken to the owner? Who is the owner? You know, can you please get in touch with them to let them know there's been an issue and get their details so we can talk to them. Other things you want to think about, um, does this horse have a passport? Yes, it's a, it's a race horse, so it's going to have a passport. We'll ask them to bring that, find that and bring it with them if the horse ends up coming in. Is the horse insured? We'll ask the trainer to find that information out as well. We may need to talk to the insurance company if it turns out that the horse is insured and requires surgery, for example, or needs to be euthanized on welfare grounds. Um, and also what the horse's medical history is. Assuming this is a client of your practice, you may be able to go and look up 
the animal's medical history in your own filing system and that can be very useful so you'll be able to you know phone the vet who's going out and give them an update this horse has had nothing wrong with him he's only been vaccinated the last two years or he had an issue in x limb four months ago again that's helpful to your colleague in that they're arriving out there with all the information that they need so there are just some examples of things that you might think about doing immediately after that first phone call okay so we'll assume some time has passed and you've got a second phone call so the vet who went out to examine the horse they had their digital x-ray machine with them they x-rayed the horse on site and they're now phoning to say this horse has a condylar fracture of its uh, metacarpal or metatarsal bone the owner has agreed to try and fix it so the horse is going to come in to have it repaired so the vet has gone out they've examined the horse they've x-rayed it they've stabilized the limb so it's now safe to transport the animal and they've given the animal some medications so you're making a note he's been given um butyl and antibiotics penicillin and gentamicin okay so Again, I'm going to ask you to pause this now for a minute and think about what would you do next? What actions will you take based on this phone call? So go ahead there and pause it for a minute and jot down a few steps you would do next. Think about what you prioritize. Okay, assume when you've paused the video and we're back now, I'm going to ask you to you know, think about what you do next. You've been told the horse is coming in, so I'm going to go and alert the surgeon and the team on theater to let them know, let the anesthetist the intern, the theatre nurse, um, that there's a horse on the way for a possible um, surgical repair of a fracture. So they can start getting ready. They can check and see what their elective caseload is for the day. They may want to reschedule or delay things slightly, um, or they may have a quick procedure they can fit in before this horse arrives. So you want to, first of all, alert your theatre team so they can start thinking about um, preparing their schedule to suit this animal. The other thing is this horse, if it is treated, it's going to be hospitalized. So you need to contact your, whoever is in charge of the animal accommodation, um, the person in charge of the barn or the yard or the nurse um, who's responsible for patient accommodation and tell them that we have a suspected fracture on the way and it's going to be hospitalized. So please think about getting the stable ready for it. That's another important part of it. The third thing is it may require more diagnostics when it arrives. So for example, uh, you'd make sure that the digital x-ray system in the hospital is ready to use and there's if there's a separate imaging unit that they're made aware of the fact that there's a horse coming in that may require pre-operative intraoperative and or post-operative x-rays so again you're giving people a chance to reschedule their timetable for the day you're not dumping suddenly work on them after the horse has arrived so that would be a good a good start okay a few minutes later the phone rings for a third time in relation to this case this time it's the owner Okay, so we mentioned already some of the things you might want to ask the owner. Again, I'll ask you to pause this and jot down a few things you'd discuss with the owner. So first of all, think about what information do you need to get from the owner and then what do they want to know? So make a, make a little note there for yourself and then we'll carry on and see some suggestions. Okay, the information we want from the owner is um, obviously we need their consent for anesthesia this horse is going to have a surgical repair. It's going to have to have a general anesthetic in most cases. Sometimes you can do these repairs under local and sedation, standing surgery, but the animal is going to have a surgical intervention. Um, so we need to get the owner's permission for that. Now, in this case, the owner's on the phone. They're not physically present. We can't get them to physically sign a form. Years ago, people used to send them a fax and they'd sign it and send it back to you. Um, fax machines are getting outdated now. But what you can do is obtain informed consent over the phone and just make a note within the patient file. So you can say, I spoke to the owner at 10 a.m. on Wednesday, the 25th of March, 2020. I made a note as to what was wrong with the animal. We discussed the surgery and the risks associated with it, and they gave consent for the procedure to go ahead. And I've made a note of that here. Now, if you're comfortable doing that, that's fine. If you're not happy discussing all the complications and prognosis with the with the owner that's no problem get um, your surgeon or, or one of the vets to talk to them it doesn't matter who does that as long as the consent that's obtained is informed and the owner knew what they were signing their horse and themselves up for so that's the first thing you need to get some consent other things you might want to know is um you know the owner might have some insights on the history of the horse if they plan to use it for breeding in the future that might be relevant if it's if it's female for example or an uncastrated male 
um, if the horse is insured, um, if there's any other owners. So if it's a syndicate, for example, there could be four owners or 80 owners or 800 owners. So does the person you're talking to have permission to give consent? Um, also, it's no harm to ask the owner as well, like if you have any questions and if there's anything they want to discuss with you. And generally they'll want to know, first of all, what are the chances of their horse making a full recovery and how long is it going to take? How much is it going to cost? Again, this might be something you're comfortable discussing. If not, pass these queries on to your surgeon or a member of the surgical team. If they're not available at the time, take the owner's details and get them to call them back. But it's really important that before that horse ever gets anaesthetized, the owner has been spoken to and is clear on what they're getting, what they're signed up for and what's going to happen next. Um, okay, so that, that's your owner. Um, next thing then is the horse is going to turn up. So the trainer's lorry driver arrives at the premises with the horse on board. The horse has been medicated by the vet in the field and it's had the limb stabilized. So now the next thing is, what are you going to do next? So think about what questions might you ask the lorry driver and what you need to proceed. So again, I'm going to ask you to pause this for a minute, jot down a few notes of those queries. Okay, um, first thing we want to do is get the lorry driver to come in and talk to you before they unload the horse. That's really important. So put a sign in your parking area saying, please report to reception before unloading any horses. Um, this animal might have trouble walking. It might be, you know, it's got a, um, a splint on its leg, which is not used to it, maybe uncomfortable. So often it's a good idea to get help to take this horse off the trailer. You also want to make sure that the, you unload the horse as smoothly as possible. So you may use the loading ramp or you may decide to unload the horse directly outside the theatre, for example, rather than make him walk across the car park. So get the driver to come in and consult with the staff so you can make a decision as to how best to unload the horse to minimise the risk of further injury and to maximise the chance of it having, to, having a good outcome. We also want to ask the lorry driver for the horse's passport. Now again, racehorse trainers are usually good about having the horse's passport and sending it with them so hopefully they've brought it we can then look at that um, and find out what is the horse's food chain status if it turns out that it's in the food chain we may have to exclude it because a lot of the drugs it needs to have for general anesthetic are um, going to be prohibited in food animals so we may have to have that conversation with the trainer and or the owner to ensure we have their go ahead to exclude the horse from the food chain if it's already signed out that's fine we want to check the horse's microchip number. That's going to be our official way of identifying it. So check its chip number and check it matches the passport so we know it's the right horse. And then we want to make sure that we check the animal's vaccination history, particularly tetanus. When was it last vaccinated against tetanus? Is its cover up to date? Again, if it's been racing, um, it will have up-to-date um, vaccines because it can't run without them. But if it's a horse that is only young and hasn't actually been on the track yet, it might be getting close to needing a vaccination or might be slightly overdue, so it's worth checking the passport for that. So we want to know horse identification, vaccination history, particularly um, tetanus, and we want to check its food chain status. And that's the main information we get from the passport. Okay, so the horse has arrived, it's going to be unloaded. Generally, we'll take preoperative um, x-rays. I know the vet in the field x-rayed it maybe an hour ago, but it's since been transported. We want to make sure that the fracture hasn't changed from what it was like in the yard. It may have been displaced slightly, for example, during the transport. So we need to make, make sure we're aware of that before we start doing surgery on it. So um, if we take some radiographs, this is an image of the right hind limb of the horse, and we can see there's a fracture here um, in the condyle of the third metatarsal bone. And this is a typical um, site for condylar fractures in horses. You can see that the fracture um, proximally is exiting out through the cortex of the bone. It's, it's displaced. Um, it's hard to see here because it's overridden by the sesamoid bones, but these fractures are always articular. So the this end of that fracture will be involving the surface of the animal's metatarsal phalangeal joint or fetlock joint. So this is an interarticular fracture, um, which means that it does require surgical reduction to give the animal the best possible chance of a full and functional recovery. If we just try and manage this fracture conservatively, the animal is going to end up with arthritis and reduce movement of the limb and reduce functionality, which is um, at best going to limit its career and at worst give rise to chronic pain. 
So just a few um, key points to bear in mind in relation to horse limb fractures. I've gone over them in the notes, but I find this is an area that um, there's a lot of common misconceptions about. Um, a lot of people assume that only race horses um, ever get limb fractures, but the reality is being a horse makes you prone to limb fractures. So all horses are prone to them because they have these long distal limbs with minimal soft tissue cover. And anytime a horse gallops or jumps, they're at risk of developing a fracture. The, the risk is very, very small, but it, it's not zero. So they can occur um, in the field or during non-maximal exercise. So people, again, assume they're only going to happen if the animal is running as fast as it can, but they commonly occur in horses who are turned out and just, you know, you hooing around and enjoying themselves. So it is important to keep that in mind. People assume that when well, he was out in the field, so he couldn't have a fracture, but unfortunately, that's not the case. Um, again, people have this idea that all fractures are fatal, and thankfully that's not the case. The vast majority of them are repairable, um, providing that the pieces are non-displaced. <clears throat> Once we still have blood supply and intact skin and soft tissue, the prognosis is reasonably good, but um, a big limiting factor is cost um, and availability of surgical expertise. The other thing is, is that um, if you think of human, if you smash your ankle, you can spend eight weeks in bed while it heals. And um, we can tell you to keep your weight off and you can use crutches. You can instruct the person to be sensible and rest it. Whereas if you think of a horse, we're using implants that are designed for use in humans. A horse is approximately eight to 10 times heavier than an adult human. And also they have to be able to walk around immediately after the procedure. So there's a lot more stress placed on fracture repairs in horses. And they're at much higher risk of um, catastrophic failure post-surgery than, than the similar fracture in humans. Um, I'm going to put up a link to an article from the horse recently where um, um, a, a surgeon from the Tufts Animal University in um, Boston reviewed um, fracture repair in the horse and he's pointed out the reasons why um, it can be problematic in this species and some of the challenges but also how much progress has been made in this field in the last 30 or 40 years and how a lot of these fractures can now be repaired. One thing to bear in mind here as well is when we talk about catastrophic fractures, we mean a fracture where the horse no longer has a functional um, limb. It's been damaged to the point that there is no longer a valid or a viable weight bearing structure. There's massive disruption of the soft tissue and the blood supply. Um, if the skin has been disrupted and there's fragments of bone come out through it and they're heavily contaminated, that animal is a hopeless case and it needs to go under euthanasia on welfare grounds immediately and this has nothing to do with the value of the horse and or how much it means to the people that own it this is a, a welfare issue these animals have a hopeless prognosis and it's not fair to try and move them or treat them it's considered to be uh, inhumane to actually try and do anything with these animals so that's important to to quantify thankfully most fractures don't fall into this category but if the animal has a catastrophic failure of the limb um, it's considered inhumane to proceed with them. It can be hard for owners to make this decision. Often it's a high pressure situation, they're upset, you're having to make a decision very rapidly that's in the horse's best interests. Um, so to help you do that, the American Association of Equine Practitioners um, came up with this con con kind of questions for justification of euthanasia. This is from the care guidelines for equine rescue and retirement facilities. Um, I'll put a link to that on the Moodle page as well. It's well worth a look at. Okay. So the questions you'd ask yourself are what they use, the criteria they use to recommend euthanasia is that the horse should not have to endure, that should be continuous, or unmanageable pain from a condition that is chronic and incurable. So we can ask horses to endure short-term pain for long-term recovery, but not to face into continuous or ongoing pain. A horse shouldn't have to endure a medical or surgical condition that has no or a hopeless chance of survival. So we don't do surgery on them when we think that there's no chance of them recovering. A horse should not have to remain alive if it has an unmanageable medical condition that renders it a hazard to itself or its handler. So an animal's got severe ataxia, for example, it's unable to move around and live independently, it's having trouble eating and drinking, it's at risk of falling over and injuring itself. That would be a condition of an animal that um, would be a hazard to itself and others. A horse should not have to receive continuous analgesic medication for the relief of pain for the rest of its life. So this is important. Um, we can give animals painkillers if and when they're needed, but if they require pain relief every single day for the rest of their life, 
that is a, a poor welfare uh, metric and it's not something that's recommended on humane grounds. It shouldn't have to endure a lifetime of continuous individual box stall confinement for prevention or relief of unmanageable pain or suffering. So the criteria is the horse should be able to be a horse. It should be able to um, act and behave like a horse. And if it can't do that, if it has to be confined, for example, that would be an example of an inhumane situation. So there are just some useful criteria to keep in mind when you're trying to manage um, some of these decisions. Thankfully, in most cases, we will be able to treat the animal like in this case. So we'll go on now and work our way through it. So back to our horse that arrived um, with the fracture. It's a fifth thoroughbred gelding. He's eight years old. He's got a Kimsey splint and bandage on his right hind limb. The horse is quiet. His heart rate is 60 beats per minute, but he can weight bear on the limb. And that's important. People assume that if the leg, leg is broken, they won't be able to weight bear on it. But if we have an appropriately splinted and supported injury um, with an intact blood supply and that's still a functional weight bearing structure, the animal will be sore, but they should be able to put weight on the limb. Okay, And the horse weighs 525 kilograms. So looking at those parameters, I've hoped you'd notice that he's a bit quiet and his heart rate is elevated, which is not surprising considering he has a you know, a painful injury. Um, but generally you'll be pleasantly surprised at kind of how sensible these animals are. They'll normally just stand there, even with a shattered limb, and they generally won't make much of a fuss because they are prey animals. So it's important to evaluate them carefully for pain. This is where your pain scoring um, could be useful. So surgical preparation, um, that's going to be covered in your surgical nursing um, lectures with, with Darren and in relation to horses as patients. So I'm not going to go into that here. Um, so the, basically what's going to happen is the horse will be prepared for surgery, we will have pre-op x-rays taken, he'll be anaesthetised and then the fracture will be stabilised, usually using an ag screws. Um, a high four-point nerve block is useful, or a high six-point in this case because it's a hind limb, um, will help reduce patient wind-up and provide more balanced and multimodal analgesia during the procedure. And then at the end of the surgery, the limb is placed in a cast and the horse is put into the recovery room. So you can see this radiograph here of image on the left is before surgery and the image on the right is post-surgery and you can see how good the reduction is that's been achieved. You can still see the fracture line but the pieces are back in place, they're tightly held there and that'll maximise the chance of a successful recovery with minimal disruption in the joint and reduce risk of arthritis. So that's, that's a good post-operative extra that you're hoping to achieve. Right, thinking about anaesthetic recovery, the horse is Back, lying on his side in the recovery box, he's still unconscious, he's been extubated, um, he's able to swallow, he's starting to wake up and he's got a full limb cast on his right hind leg. So thinking about how this guy's going to recover, um, pause it there and think about what problems could you foresee and how might you address them. Okay, so when you've had to think about this, problems you can anticipate is he's going to have a right hind limb that doesn't flex anymore because there's a cast on it and he may be in pain. So hopefully he'll be sensible and get up nice and slowly. But there is a risk he'll start to panic and trash around as he wakes up and finds this, finds himself in this strange and potentially painful situation. He may also have a full bladder. Often we give these animals fluids while they're anaesthetized to keep, maintain their hydration. So if he's a full bladder and he's uncomfortable, he's going to try and get up more quickly to urinate. If he does urinate then on the recovery room floor, he's going to make it very slippery and that's going to increase the risk of them falling over, not to mention contaminating your cast with urine. Um, other things to bear in mind as well is that, um, you know, his temperament is going to come into it. If he's been calm and sensible on induction, hopefully he'll be the same in recovery, but we do want him to recover nice and gently and slowly. If he starts trashing around and panicking, he may um, fracture the limb again catastrophically, and that's going to be the end of him. So if you have a means to um, have an assisted recovery with a head and tail rope, this would be a good candidate to use them on. Now, you could also sedate the horse in recovery so he stays down and calm for longer. And I'd also really stress the importance of keeping your recovery area nice and calm and quiet and dark. So put the horse into the recovery box, put a towel over his eyes, and keep the area dimly lit. Don't start banging and clattering and running hoses and tidying up outside because that noise in particular will disrupt them and make them try and get up too quickly. So with this horse I'd be 
um, catheterizing his bladder to empty it before I put him in recovery. I'd be checking if he's had enough pain relief during the procedure. He should still have anesthetic or sort of still have analgesics in his system. I want a nice quiet area. I may put cotton wool in his ears as well to reduce the noise. I'm going to cover his eyes. I'm going to keep the area dark. And if I have a head and tail rope system for an assisted recovery, I'm going to use them. So hopefully that will get him back on his feet without any catastrophic issues. Right, then if we think about post-op care, the animal is going to be hospitalised and placed in a stable under your care. So in this case, think about your four-step um, nursing practice model. Um, you've got information about the patient from his history and what has happened to him while he's been under your care. Then you're going to think about identifying and prioritising nursing interventions, develop your care plan, and you're going to reevaluate your patient. So they're all important things to consider in this case. Okay, so patient care, one hour post recovery, the horse is ready to be returned to his stable and put back on a bed of shaving. So how will you move him? How are you going to get him from the recovery box back to the stable? I'd suggest this is at least a two person job, one person to lead his head and one person to hold on to the end of his tail to give him a bit of assistance and balance as he gets used to the full limb cast on his hind leg. So definitely two people and you're going to move him nice and gently and slowly you're going to make sure the area is free of any trip hazards for you and him before you start. It's going to be well lit. You're going to make sure all the doors are open along the way and you're going to take your time moving them so there's no um, hurrying or sharp turns to reduce the risk of him stumbling or falling. Okay, later that evening, you go in and look at the horse. He's quiet. His heart rate 72 beats per minute. He's ignoring his surroundings, not moving, not eating or not drinking. No droppings in the stable. So what could be wrong with this horse? Again, I'll ask you to pause it and make a list of suggestions for yourself as to what could be wrong with him. Uh, this might help. So this is, um, B is the picture of your current patient. For comparison, um, here's A. So the question is, is horse B in pain? What do you think? Hopefully this point you're saying yes. If you remember our pain scoring, um, he's got his ears are held uh, low with the base down on the side of the head and they're slightly turned outwards. The muscles over his eyes are contracted, give him an anxious appearance. There's tension in the muscles on the side of the face and in the muzzle. So his lips are tightly pressed together, giving you a kind of a V-shaped appearance to the front of his muzzle, um, whereas horses A has a curved muzzle. And then there's tension in the nostrils, so they're dilated in a lateral medial direction, um, giving you this kind of open appearance. So yeah, um, that is a pain face. We mentioned that he had no droppings, so you're going to auscultate his abdomen. We're happy to report that his intestinal motility is normal. There's plus plus or normal motility in all four quadrants. So hopefully that will rule out, rule out colic or um, ileus from the general anaesthetic. His heart is faster than normal, but the rhythm and sounds are as we'd expect. So what's your conclusion? Again, what do you think is wrong with this patient? Why are you going to go back and tell your vet? Okay, hopefully you're going to go back and tell your vet you think the horse is in pain. Um, and could you improve his pain relief or his pain control? So you can do your pain score on him if you want. Um, the highest possible score is 30. Anything um, over 10 you want to be considering doing something about it. So you can ask, the assuming this horse is a high score, you go back and ask your vet to prescribe more pain relief for him. OK, so he got buked this morning, but it turns out he ha hasn't had any um, NSAID since. He had some opioids during the anaesthetic. They've worn off now. So we can um, get the vet to prescribe more anti-inflammatories for him. We can administer those. Probably intravenously be the best choice here. He's probably not going to be eating just yet. So you'll have a catheter in from the surgery. You can give him some intravenous phenylbutazone or ketoprofen or flixin, whatever the vet prescribes. That'll be a start. But... Um, this animal has had major surgery and he's got a fracture repair, which is probably very painful. It's in a hind limb. So we'd also suggest considering um, multimodal analgesia. So another option is an equine epidural. These are really easy to place. They're very, very practical and useful. What you're doing is you're injecting opioids, um, usually morphine, into the epidural space um, at the base of the tail. So between the first... Um, the end of the sacrum and the first or second coccygeal vertebrae. At this point, the spinal cord is 
ended. So you're not going to cause the horse any um, nerve injuries by doing this procedure. You clip and scrub the area and do it in a septic manner. So you're putting on sterile gloves, using a new needle and syringe and so on. And you're injecting about 10 mils of um, diluted morphine solution into the epidural space. And this gives really, really good hind limb pain relief without any ataxia and no systemic side effects. So we don't get any dysphoria, um, no ileus. The duration of action is much longer, up to 24 hours. So it's a really, really good technique. I've done it in practice and it's very straightforward. There's a nice article by Gold from 2008 that talks you through how to do the procedure. Really useful, um, one to be aware of, very straightforward to do. I thoroughly recommend for animals with hind limb pain. It's also good for mares, say, that have, have had a difficult foaling or um, perineal injuries during foaling and you want to give them some pain relief as well. Very, very safe, cheap and effective method, provided you observe basic asepsis and it gives really good and long acting pain relief. Um, calculation then. So the vet has prescribed morphine via the epidural route at 0.1 mg per kg. The patient weighs 525 kilos. You've got 10 um, mg vials of morphine. Each vial contains two mils. So take a break there for a minute and calculate how much morphine will you need. Okay, what are you going to come up with? So done the calculation here. Um, body weight in or body weight multiplied by mg per kg. So it's 0.1 by 525 divided by mg per mil. So we know that there's um, 10 mg in two mils. So half that there's five mg in one mil. So divided by five. So it's 0.1 by 525 divided by five. And that's going to give us 10.5 mils of morphine. Okay, we'll dilute that to 20 mils of sterile um, saline and then we'll inject that slowly uh, over about a minute into the patient's epidural space. You can use either um, a one and a half inch needle or a three and a half inch spinal needle. In my experience, a one and a half inch needle does the job. Um, I never had to use a spinal needle at the base of the tail. You might, I suppose, in a very big horse, but this hasn't been a, a problem in my experience. Okay. So that's um, a quick run through an equine orthopedics um, case scenario. I'm going to um, ask stop here now, ask you to go through this yourself. Any questions that you might have, please post them on the Moodle forum for me and I'll go through them. Thank you.